Hi, welcome to the MPI workshop presented by the NSS Exceed program. This was originally a two-day event with hands-on exercises that you can view at your own pace. To get access to the exercises and slide content, look at the link below. This is where it starts to get uh, exciting. We're going to turn you into MPI programmers in the next uh, hour and a half or so. Uh, before you walk out of here today, you will be doing MPI programming. Uh, so briefly, why, why use MPI in particular? Uh, the, and there are some very, very compelling reasons. This is not a, uh, a, a hard argument to win about uh, why you should use MPI versus the several alternatives that are I could mention and hundreds more that somebody has dreamt up over the decades. Uh, MPI has been around a long time, uh, 20 plus years actually coming up on 30 years not too distant future. Uh, and, and over the course of time, it's become absolutely dominant. It is the way people do uh, large-scale computing. It will be around a long time. So, as I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of roadmaps, a lot of commitment to using this as the baseline language for programming these things. Over time, it's developed a lot of libraries, which is a wonderful thing. You can roll in uh, tons and tons of functionality. Uh, and if libraries, if you'd rather have just the access to the algorithms to roll your own or develop or extend those libraries, there's lots and lots of, of algorithmic uh, development that's been done that you can leverage, build upon, extend. So, you know, people like to discuss at scale. If somebody's discussing how to do something in parallel, very often it'll be in the, in the direct context of MPI because that's practically how it's going to end up getting implemented. It's very scalable. As we mentioned, I say 3 million cores. I could update this slide now with the new machine having 10 million cores out there. That's what it's running on. Uh, it's very, very portable. Everything we'll do this afternoon, everything we'll do in this workshop, you can take and run on your laptop without changing a character of. You can take and run in any other environment. MPI is a, a very good example of a standard that's well enough written that corner cases and exceptions don't have to be made. The committee's been very concerned about that over the years, making sure that everything is very portable, and it does work out that way. It works with hybrid models, by which we mean mixing and matching this with other things like uh, OpenMP, for example, or GPU programming, it works very well with those. All the standards committees that want to do parallel computing recognize they have to be interoperable with MPI or there's really no point in doing what they're doing, and it does work out well. I'll have some examples of that. So we'll briefly do at the end tomorrow, I'll, I'll show you some examples of the pieces working together. Uh, the uh, explicit parallelization that we'll have to do here, starting from scratch as we do our very first exercise here, is a little bit uh, tedious uh, and or painful and or error prone in some ways. It takes more work to do MPI. But because of that, when you're done, your parallelization is very much in your hands. It's under your control. It means the way the data is split up, the way it's been laid out is not an afterthought or it's not something that the compiler has done for you behind the scenes. And it gives you an awful lot of power over uh, improving efficiencies and moving things around and doing things. It, that'll become clear as you start to do this. Uh, so it's a great long-term investment. You will not regret learning MPI because it's been superseded by something else. It's just fallen out of favor or whatnot. And even if you don't end up using it explicitly for coding, and there are always a couple people here who are just trying to get a vibe for what it's about, it's very good in that in, the, in a couple of days you'll have a good solid understanding of it and then you can appreciate when somebody says, well, we want to use this software framework or we want to target this, this hardware. You'll have an idea of how realistic that is or how painful it would be to port something. So let's look at what MPI is. MPI, to put it in one sentence, we'd say that the message passing interface standard is a library that allows you to do problems in parallel using message passing to communicate between processes. And that is accurate and it is concise, but we have to break it down to really make it useful to you. It is a library. This is a wonderful thing. MPI is not a new language. It is not. There are lots of parallel programming languages out there. Any new language, even if it's an extension on the one that you're familiar with, brings a lot of subtleties along with it. And uh, you know, those are, those are always trickier than you think they should be. Extending a language is never an easy thing to do. On the other hand, a library is wonderful. It's very clear what the delineation is and how to use it. Uh, and it works then with all the existing tools that are out there. It works with all of your knowledge of the, la of the, the language that you're, you're building on. So it is a library. Uh, we'll find out that allows us to link it in and use it like any other library, and it'll be comforting, I think, to, to many of you to know that all of your programming experience and the language of your choice is, is still absolutely valid. We talk about message passing. Message passing is a paradigm. Uh, you know, and what, what, is it, what does paradigm mean here? It means simply that 
we're sending chunks of data back and forth between these processes, these processes that are communicating with each other, and we'll see it because we're going to start doing some examples right now, and you'll see it's nothing more than chunks of data. A message is not some grand abstraction. It's hard to get your hand around. It's something like, here's our array of, here's our 10 by 10 array of floating point numbers. That's a message. Here's a string of characters that's 25 characters long. That's a message. We talk about communicating here between things. Uh, we'll find out one of the nice things about M MPI is it's going to abstract away the network. It is up to whoever builds the machine to make sure the interface is well with the MPI library, and everybody does. Again, MPI is a baseline technology. So whenever somebody builds a network card, it's the people that make InfiniBand, the people that make any kind of Ethernet adapters, all these people are responsible for making sure that MPI works well and efficiently with their hardware, and they do because MPI is a priority. So we're going to not have to worry about any of that stuff. It'll just be, be portable. And this last thing here does deserve a little bit of attention. We say it communicates between processes. Uh, MPI, as far as it's concerned, it's happy sending data back and forth between what you can think of as a Unix or a Windows process. A process on a machine is that thing that in Windows you bring up Task Manager, you've got processes, in Unix you type PS, gives you a list of processes on the machine. Uh, those processes are what MPI is really communicating between. And you know that the number of processes on a machine could be anything you want it to be. A Windows or, or a Unix box or something like a Mac, at any point in time, you probably have 100 processes running right now. That's way more than you have cores or anything else. They're just things that swap in and out in memory uh, as, they, as they run. And MPI is happy communicating between those. It sends data back and forth between those. However, the way that you want to use MPI for performance purposes is it's nice to have one process per core or per PE, per processing element. We want to have one process per core because there's no point in having more processes per core for performance. It's just going to swap things back and forth. You're not going to run faster, right? So in the scientific world, most of the MPI codes that you're going to write are going to run so that they communicate. You have one process on each core on the machine, and they send data back and forth. So we break our weather map up into our 50 processes, and each one of them will be running on its own little core, and they'd be sending data back and forth. But MPI could theoretically run on your laptop, which may, might only have four cores on it, right? But you could fire up 100 pro MPI processes, and they would run away. They'd be slow, because they'd be swapping in and out. You wouldn't get any performance improvement, but maybe you could test your code or debug it. However, in, in the real world, for practical purposes, it's generally run with one process per core. And that's the way we'll do all of our exercises, for example, on bridges here. So let's do some basic MPI. To do basic MPI, we need a, some, some capabilities. We need to be able to start the processes up to send and receive messages, that's the whole point of message passing, and we'll find out that synchronizing things at the appropriate point is also critical to make algorithms work right, to make just things work out. With these four capabilities, we could build pretty much any program we wanted. So you might say, okay, I need to learn a handful of routines. And, and that is technically true. And then you look at the MPI spec and you go, oh, MPI 3 actually has over 400 functions in it. It's got a lot of stuff in there. What is that stuff? Is it useless and superfluous extra stuff? Uh, is it going to take me forever to get a handhold on this? No, we'll find out that MPI has these families of functions that do these things here, and it has many, many variations for your convenience sake. But we'll find out that they group together in families. They're very well logically organized, and so it's not hard to understand what the vast majority of these routines are as long as you master these basic processes. We'll see that as we go along. Today, for our exercises, we're going to use the dozen or so really important MPI routines uh, that you'll find in every MPI code. We'll get a whole lot done with it, and theoretically, we could write any algorithm with those routines. Then tomorrow, we'll branch out and we'll roll in another uh, you know, 20 or 30 MPI routines that are fairly common and, and useful, that are variations, just for your convenience on that. And you'll see that, oh, with that in hand, almost all the other routines that are out there in the library make perfect sense to you. They're just variations and relatives that, allow, that make life a little bit easier for you. So that, that theme will emerge here as we do some examples and work our way through it. So let's do a hello world example. It's always a good place to start. Our hello world example is going to be a, a code that just says hello from each one of the PEs that it's running on. So each process out there is going to say hello. We'll find out that MPI processes are identified by a number. They each have a rank is the, the term you'll see used in the documentation. It goes from zero to however many PEs there are, minus one. So if we run this on eight PEs, we'll, we'll, say, we'll get a hello from each one of them. When we run the code, we launch it with a command that's typically called, it's not part of the spec, but almost everybody has a command called something like MPI run. And this says launch my MPI program executable. Here it's called the executable's a.out on this many processes. 
we'll find that MPI codes, well-written codes, can run on varying numbers of processes at runtime. So you could write a code that only works properly on four processes, and, and that you could do that might even be the right thing to do in some limited circumstance. But in general, it's nice to write MPI codes that can size up and size down. That way, you can use your laptop, or some user can use your, their laptop to, to process data, but then she can also go and run on some supercomputer with a million cores without having to touch the source code. So that's the, the kind of, uh, of approach that most MPI codes start with, is they, they want to be able to run on varying varying counts. So here's our Hello World program, and this would run on any number of PEs. Each one of those PEs will say hello to us. How will we write this? Well, we'd write it with a code that looks something like this. Uh, it's fairly straightforward. We will step through this line by line. Don't worry if I seem to be skipping ahead here or, or overlooking things. We'll step through every character of this code. But this is the C version of the code. It's not that, that immense or complicated. And this is the Fortran version. We'll go through C and Fortran versions for most of the exercises that we do here over the next couple of days. Uh, so because that, that covers most of the basis of uh, high performance numerical computing. The C++ guys out there, fear not. This is, you know, obviously you're going to be comfortable with what we do here. Uh, for those of you that might have uh, other languages in mind as your priority, we'll talk about that. But these are the two that the spec, the spec is written to the canonical languages that has official bindings to it, Fortran and C. So that's another reason we'll stick with these. But if you're, say, a Python program and you want to use MPI, if you play along here, uh, and you probably won't have a problem reading the Fortran code, certainly, because I, I, I'm not using every fancy feature I can extract out of the languages. If you play along here, at the end I'll mention some of the bindings that for other languages that are available, and you can see how it works. But Fortran and C are the official bindings that you'll see in the specs for these languages, and we'll go through both of them. So these are the Fortran Hello World programs. So we'll, we'll go through it. Fear not again that I'm jumping over it, but let's look at some of the things that are, that are in this code that are general before we look at the specifics codes. First of all, any MPI code is going to have a header file because, as I mentioned, it's a library. It's not a new language, so like any library, it's got some header file that defines the things that are going on in it. For C, it's mpi.h. For Fortran, it's mpif.h. And that, that defines everything all the routines we'll use. All the routines that we will use are easy to spot. They all start with mpi underscore. So it's easy to find anything that's related to MPI that's defined in that header file in your code. Uh, it'll be very straightforward. Most of the MPI routines, where it's appropriate, return an error condition. Uh, MPI success means that things work correctly. Now, we will not check this error condition for every routine that we call an MPI. We probably should, uh, but like most real programmers, you get a little bit lazy and we're not going to do it. And furthermore, we just clutter up a lot of our examples here that don't need it. But any of the MPI routines you see do return uh, if we wanted to check the return condition errors. Now, in Fortran, because Fortran routines don't return a value, uh, it's the last parameter. So the only difference you'll see between the Fortran and the C routines is that the Fortran routines will have one extra parameter on the end that's the error code. In C, we could check that as the return value if we wanted. Otherwise, the two will be exactly the same as we go along here. A couple of routines that are in the Hello World program that are universal to any MPI routine you're going to call are, are MPI init, MPI finalize, and MPI con, con rank. Uh, now, MPI init and MPI finalize just do whatever bookkeeping that particular computer needs to do to start up the MPI system and to shut it down. So in some clusters, for example, behind the scenes, it fires up daemons, it communicates things in the background, it does whatever it needs to do. Uh, on a supercomputer that's built around MPI, it has a little less work to do. You don't care about any of that stuff. Just make sure that before you start using MPI in your routine, you call MPI init. So it needs to be the first MPI routine in your code, not the first routine of any sort, but the first MPI routine. Likewise, when you're done using MPI, you should call finalize. That flushes buffers out and shuts things down, whatever it has to do on that particular configuration. Again, don't concern yourself with the details, just call it. It should be the last MPI routine that you call before you, you, you quit. Uh, so those are just standard. Now MPI init, you will notice on the C version of it, it likes, MPI likes to have the command line arguments. So if you're a, an experienced C programmer, you, you know what the command line arguments are. They're the things that whatever you start your program with are also there on that same line. If you're kind of newish to C and you're not familiar with these, uh, you, you'd see them soon enough in simple examples of C code. Uh, again, these are the arguments that the user might give the program when they run it. Uh, MPI likes to know about those, so MPI init likes to know about those in case it wants to pass them along to other pieces of the code. So it wants them. It's cut and paste. Don't worry about that. There's no profound significance here. Just MPI init in C, you should pass along argc C and argv. Um, there's, there's nothing more to it than that. Now, this one is actually interesting. It's comrank. Comrank, it tells us 
what R tells each individual MPI process as it's running away out there in your cluster what its address is. Each one of these MP, uh, MPI processes has an address. Again, it's called rank in the documentation. It has its own rank, and it will go from zero to whatever. This is where it finds that out. So each one of the, the, the nodes that's running away out there, each one of the, the cores that's running away out there, when it calls com rank, it will get back this value that in most of my codes here and in many MPI codes, you'll see something like my PE number. So I think I'll use that in all of my examples here. My PE number is the PE number for each one of the separate uh, cores that are running away out there. So again, we'll, we'll skip ahead a little bit. I'm just trying to run, work through the whole process once and we'll come back line by line and look at what's going on here. But if this, if this Hello World program is correctly written, uh, all we need to do to run it is to compile it with any standard C or Fortran compiler. So don't let the fact that we're using ones called MPICC and MPIF90 fool you. This is a standard C and Fortran compiler. It just so happens that it's fairly standard that uh, MPI environments, when you set them up, give you a wrapper around your normal compiler called MPICC and MPIF90. In the case of Bridges, for example, and this PGF compiler, all it's really doing is saving us the dash LMPI command, linking in dash LMPI, and also a few other optional paths. So we could just use, we could just say cc lmpi hello.c, and it would be the same result, and it would work. Feel free to try it yourself. So do not let the fact that these little wrappers, which again are pretty standard in MPI programming, exist, cause you to think you're using a special compiler. We are not. We're using a dead standard C and Fortran compiler here. When it's done, our dead standard compilers by default will spit out an executable called a.out. So that's what we've got. And therefore, when we go to run it, we run a.out. So once we've compiled this Hello World program, uh, it's, it's, we run it with on however many PEs we want. At runtime, we decide that. So with the A.out out sitting around on your disk, and if it's you know, a normally well-written MPI code, it's happy to run on eight processors or two or 2,000. It doesn't know until you run it. When at runtime, you say, okay, give me eight processors and run this A.out out on it. And then they say hello from each one of the PEs. Well, you'll notice here, actually, this is kind of, they're not quite in order here. What's going on? Why aren't they in order? Well, let's think about what happens when we actually run a Hello World program. And we'll come back to these lines of code again and step through them line by line. Fear not. But in general, the important concept, the key concept in MPI, the one that if you really get, you're going to be fine. And until you get it, you're going to be a little bit confused. And it's hard to have it sink in after years of serial programming. The key concept in MPI is very simple, actually. It's that that executable, when you run it, gets copied to a bunch of separate processes out there. And they run independently. One way I, I think is very helpful to think of this, and I'll refer to this uh, particular configuration countlessly over the next day, is that we're running on a cluster that we built ourselves. In this case, we bought eight white boxes, we bought eight generic computers, we built our own cluster, we stuck them together with Ethernet, they're sitting in a closet down the hallway, right? That's our cluster, it's eight computers. When we run this A dot out with MPI run on them, it puts one copy on each one of those computers, Let's pretend they're old school, crappy serial computers, one core per, per processor. So they're really old 486s that you got out of a, a salvage yard. So they've got one processor, one core per process on your eight boxes sitting on the floor. When we run our Hello World program, each one of those gets a copy of the same binary, the same program. They are running eight copies of the same program. That is the magic of MPI. It copies the same executable, and it starts them all simultaneously, or as close as it can get, and they just run. They're normal serial programs running in multiple copies. That's, that's the hardest thing to think of, actually, for a lot of people, is to think, I've got a serial program running multiple copies. Not that I've got one program running line by line, because it's not. It's, it's eight copies of a program that are all running away, doing their own thing. And their own thing, in this case, happens to be each one of them just wants to say hello to us, and it says hello from, and each one of them has a separate rank, a separate PE number that it found out by calling com rank, and so each one of them says hello. And the reason that the order is mixed up is because there's no particular order in, in mind as far as they're concerned. They're just eight PEs running away. One of them might start sooner than the other. One of them might be faster than the other. One of them might have a bunch of viruses running on it, slowing it down. They might even be different models of processors. That's perfectly permitted in MPI. Uh, used to be quite common. People would assemble clusters with all kinds of different machines sitting around. So we don't know what order it is, and from one run to the next, the order might even change. Probably would. 
That's fine too. Now we'll find out later on. We certainly have the capability and the controls in MPI to put these things in order if we want. But by default, our, our simple Hello World program, it's going to probably say different order every time we run it. And again, that's fine. So what happened here is that we, we compiled this code. We, we ran it. It says hello in one order, hello in another order. It's very straightforward. Now, one of the things that people also have difficulty with at first when I say we're running the same code, copies of the same code, is then you might start to think the same code. It's all, they're all locked into doing the same thing. Uh, how am I going to get any work done when I've got my weather map and they each should be working on a different state? They're all running the same code. There's no limitation by running the same code to saying that each one of those copies has to be doing the same thing at any point in time. Here's an extreme example right here where we write one code and we can simply inside that one code have a bunch of routines that are doing very drastically different things. So we can have one code, one A dot out that inside of it says, hey, PE0 can run space invaders, PE1 can crack passwords, PE2 can do our weather forecasting. There's nothing, this is one code, right? But each processor is off doing a drastically different thing. So there's no limitation by saying we have one executable that's got copies doing things. That means those copies have to be doing the same thing at any point in time. They can be doing drastically different things. Now this is ridiculously extreme. What you typically find, a very common paradigm in MPI programming is what's called master-slave. In a master-slave paradigm, you'll see something like this, and we'll find this emerging naturally in our code as we attempt to do things. We'll find that a master-slave paradigm that you often have one special PE, uh, usually it's PE0. There's always a PE0, so why not make it the special PE? <coughs> usually PE0 will be doing some special stuff, like maybe asking for input from the user, some kind of coordination stuff. And all the other PEs will be doing a lot of the heavy lifting, the, the work. So this is master-slave paradigm is something that, again, is, is a very common pattern in MPI. Uh, our Hello World code is really simple-minded, so it's just everybody's running the same routine. You know, they are all running exactly the same code, doing exactly the same thing. The only difference between them is they have a different address. So here's, a, here's an analogy to remember. Again, if you can keep this in mind uh, as you're starting on MPI, it will save confusion. Think of an MPI program as, as a book that our, we've got a book group, and we're all reading the same book. We want to get our, our thoughts on it from each other, and we're doing reviews on our book. So we're all reading the same book. So it's the same set of instructions, but we certainly don't, don't all have to be in the same place. As a matter of fact, the book might be one of those choose-your-own-adventure books, right, where you flip from one page, which way do you want to go, and it's got different paths through the book. So everybody's reading a choose-your-own-adventure book, potentially. So we've got the same book, but we could be in very different places. So it doesn't make sense at any point in time to say, what line of an, is an MPI program on? So you, you don't want to say, what line is our program on, because we've got eight different copies here. They could be in eight different places in the code that's perfectly fine, and it's kind of the default thing that they'll do. Likewise, I might ask everybody in our reading group to rate each chapter in the book, to scribble a number down on each chapter saying what they thought of that particular chapter. Now, that means it would, doesn't also make sense for me to say, what's the uh, rating for chapter three, right? We have eight different ratings for chapter three. So variables in MPI, also there's eight copies of it. So you don't look at a variable in MPI program where it's X, you know, you say x equals, you know, y plus 3. You don't say, what's the value of x? You say, what's the value of, of x on processor 2? You could say, what's the value of x on processor 0? But there's no longer just an x to refer to. So when you're looking through your codes and you're writing your codes today, just keep realizing that. As you're writing a piece of code that's going to get copied to those, to those nodes in your cluster. In the cluster that you built, that, that piece of code is going to get copied and run simultaneously. So this is the paradigm of MPI. And it's, it's a stubborn thing to get into your head if you've been just thinking serially for forever. Uh, but once it does, it makes perfect sense. And it's very simple. It's, it, you, it will avoid confusion. There is no magic ever happening behind the scenes coordinating or synchronizing things. Uh, so the last little thing before we go back and step through this, this code line by line again is that the uh, com rank routine had one parameter. It's the only mystery thing in the code if you go back and look at it from what we've discussed so far. It's called a communicator. Uh, a lot of MPI routines have this communicator uh, parameter in them. And the communicator is something that as we get more complicated with our MPI codes, we'll find that it's very helpful at times to divide our PEs up into different sets. With a low world, they're all doing exactly the same thing. But you may have in a weather code, you may have some PEs that are responsible for, say, land, and some PEs that are responsible for the ocean. And they might want to be doing different things. So sometimes it's nice to have the instructions correspond to one group of PEs or another. Communicators facilitate that. We'll find tomorrow, we'll find lots of examples of how communicators can be wonderfully helpful. But 
a lot of times there's no point in it. You just want all the PEs to do the same thing. They're all working cooperatively, in which case there's a default placeholder, MPI Com World, the world communicator, all the PEs. And so our Hello World program, we're not doing any sub fancy subset stuff. We want all the PEs to be grouped together, so we'll use the world communicator uh, for, for all of these. You'll often use the world communicator even in very sophisticated codes, but sometimes it's, it's nice to be able, or if, if necessary even, to be able to break things up into subsets. Okay, so here's the fundamental concept. Let's go back and look at the source code here and what comes out of it. So if we look at our source code here, this stuff is just headers, nothing interesting there. Uh, this stuff is just standard C or Fortran here. Where we've got the only variable we care about in the program is my PE number. Uh, and then we call MPI init to start MPI up. There's nothing interesting about that. MPI com rank that tells us our PE number. That's slightly interesting. And then we print out our PE number. We call MPI finalize and we quit. So this is our entire code. There's nothing, should be nothing mysterious in the code now. And when we run eight copies of it, we expect something like this to happen. So this is, ask, start asking questions now if you don't understand anything, because this is where you, you don't want to get left behind now on this, the fundamental stuff here. Uh, so basically we're writing standard C or Fortran. So if at any point in time you look at, the, at this code and you don't understand some syntax or something, don't, don't think it's an MPI thing. It's a standard C or Fortran, everything, including the MPI routines. They're standard library type routines. We take that standard for, C or Fortran, we compile it, and then with MPI run, we run simultaneously, but independently, copies on the multiple nodes. So everybody get this? Make, make sure you do. Ask questions here or you know, throughout the, the day as we build on this. But we're going to build everything on this idea here. So our next example that we'll, we'll, we'll start to send and receive messages. Message passing is the obvious thing to do. So we're going to build on what we just did by adding in a, some messages. We're going to have this run on two PEs. Yes? Can you elaborate a little bit more about standard input, standard output of those processes? Uh, that's a good question. So standard question here was, can I elaborate a little bit on standard input, standard output? And I did uh, gloss over that. I had this on the slide right here, but I glossed over it a little bit quicker than I guess I should have. Uh, MPI is generally, it's, it's nice in that wherever you start the MPI run command from, generally the standard output and the standard input will come from that terminal shell. So that is a nice convenience. Uh, the reason I tend to overlook it is that in serious codes, right, as you get into production mode, writing your real codes, we don't care so much about the user typing input. And you're probably going to be, things are going to be read in from big giant configuration files and your results are going to be written out to big files. But standard input is a nice way for the user to, uh, to monitor things, certainly. Uh, and it's what we're using our exercises here. So the standard input and the standard output come from that MPI command terminal. So again, if you built your cluster, uh, and you got your eight boxes scattered on the floor, and uh, you want to read some input in, uh, it is nice in that whatever terminal, you know, whichever one of those nodes it's connected to that actually you type the MPI run command in from, it'll make sure that standard out gets to the other uh, PEs, and that anything that they spit out, in this case printing out hello, comes that standard output comes back to the terminal. Uh, that's also true with standard error as well. So uh, it's, uh, that's a nice little piece of magic that does happen in the background because of MPI run. Okay, so sending and receiving a message is, is the most basic thing we can do with message passing, and we're going to do it here with two PEs. We're going to have, with two PEs, we always have PE0 and PE1. That's our, our numbering scheme MPI is going to give us back. So we're going to have PE1 uh, send a message. It's going to be the message in this case. is message is always just some kind of data, some collection of data. In this case, it's going to be a single integer. It's going to send the integer 42 from PE1 to PE0, and then PE0 will print it out. This is our most basic message passing. And this is a good time to start to get familiar with a little bit of the MPI documentation, uh, which you're fortunate in that it's pretty high quality stuff, as one might imagine, from a widely used, very mature library. And also, uh, equally, I think, nice is the fact that there are alternative versions. There's lots of MPI documentation out there. I'll give you a couple examples, and you can feel free to pick the one that, that suits you. Some people like really concise documentation. Others like things that have lots of examples in it. Uh, and so there are multiple places in the MPI community to find MPI documentation for the routines. Uh, so here's one, here's, here's a, a page basically, or a section of a page from one of the more concise ones, the one that I'll give you a link to at the end. So the document for MPI send documentation looks uh, something like this. I've added it a little bit. But it basically gives us each one of the parameters of the MPI routine. 
So that's, that's pretty much what MPI documentation is about, is once you get the basic idea of what the routines do, the many variations on it are just hey, different parameters to accommodate different situations you might run into. In our case, we've got the most basic send routine in MPI, and so these are the parameters for it. The first parameter is the variable that we want to send, and so we tell it which, which the name of that variable. In C, we want to give it a pointer to that variable, uh, so you see people are very comfortable with that. Fortran people, you can just ignore this ampersand or sign right here. In Fortran, you just give it the variable name that you want to send. So we give it the variable we want to send, then we tell it how many of them there are. What do we mean by that? Very often in MPI, in scientific codes in general, you work with arrays. So if you have a lot of something, we can point at a lot of those. We can send an array of, of numbers and say how many of that array we want to send. For our starting example and for, you know, for a good many of our examples, we'll just want to send one of something. Uh, then we need to tell the data type. This is something we have to be conscientious about in MPI, is making sure that our types are correct. It's a common source of errors is to mismatch these. So in our case, we want to send one integer. There's a list in the documentation of all the MPI types, and they're very intuitive. It's exactly what you'd expect. So MPI int is a, is a C integer type. The next parameter is the destination. All the message passing in MPI takes place between addresses, known addresses. So you have a destination for your send. It's the MPI rank. In our case, we know we got two PEs, and we want PE1 to send to PE0. So PE1 is going to call a send and send to PE0. The next parameter is a useful little bonus feature of MPI that turns out to be incredibly convenient and useful in a lot of uh, algorithms. Sometimes, and, and other algorithms, it's completely useless, and we just don't care about it, and we can ignore it. And it's the message tag. So an MPI with any, kind, with any message, we can send this extra thing along that can, it's generally used to sort messages between different types. So for example, in our weather code, we might send variables around that represent uh, pressures, and we might send other messages around that represent uh, humidity. And we could use different tags. They're an integer, so it's a, it's a simple integer. It's a 16-bit integer. We could use different uh, tags to represent uh, what those different message types are, and just sort and filter them as we go. Sometimes that's very convenient. Other times, who cares about the tag? Just set it equal to zero and don't worry about it. But the parameter is in a lot of these routines in case you want to use it. And the last parameter here is this communicator. As I've said, uh, dealing with different subsets is something that can be very useful as well in a lot of algorithms. We'll see some examples of that tomorrow. But for today's examples, and even in, in a fairly you know, complex problem we're going to do today, we'll never need to deal with communicators, so we'll just always use the calm world communicator. That just says use all the PEs and have them participate in this routine. So here's our send routine. Now the receive routine looks a lot like our send. As a matter of fact, that's why I have this, this hint here to avoid a lot of mistakes about making sure that your types match up and that your message counts match up and everything else. Cut and paste. Cut your, cut your send routine and paste it to where your receive routine is and edit it is a good, good way to go. So if, you, uh, if you'll notice, a lot of the parameters match. They must match to make things work. So let's look at what happens on the receive end. So the PE that wants to receive a message, it gives the variable that it wants that message to get put into. And again, in C, we need to give it a pointer in uh, the address. Uh, in, uh, uh, in Fortran, we can ignore this ampersand. Uh, we want to give it the count and the type, again, because we might receive an array. We're not in this case, so we're only going to receive one, of, one integer. Now we get the chance when we're receiving messages. In MPI, message receiving can be a, a, a filter, can be very selective, and that can be very useful. You might have a lot of messages coming at you, but in this particular time, I'm looking for humidity. That's what I care about. So I can start to select where my messages come from and what their tags are. I can filter. Uh, I can, I can put in here, from the source, a particular number, and the message will only come from that source. In this case here, I could use a 1. I know in our code that we're constructing, I'm sending a message from 1 to 0. So PE0 that's going to call this receive routine could have a 1 in here, and it would work just fine. But I could also stick in the wild card, which says I'm going to receive any message, and MPI's predefined wild card is MPI any source. So that says take, take a message coming from any direction. Take just, I, I want to read this message. Likewise with tags. We can use tags as filters, or we can be very promiscuous here and say, give me anything that's waiting for me, any tag. So this is a very promiscuous receive. It's going to take any message with any tag coming at it. Uh, and the world communicator, again, says we're not doing any fancy things with subsets of PEs. And the last parameter on the, on the receive that does get added on here that wasn't in sent, the status allows us to, after the fact, after we receive the message, we can at that point see the source and the tag of the message if we care. So we can say, give me any message waiting for me. I've got work to do. But, oh, where did that message come from? We could check that with status. 
So here's the full code to send and receive. Here's the C1. We'll step through the Fortran 1 in just a second. Here's the full C code. So let's look at this. We've got our standard headers involved here. We've got our header files. We've got our MPI init, com rank. So this is just generic MPI stuff here. Now here's actually where the message passing takes place. We say, if I'm PE0, I want to receive a message. If I'm not PE0, well then I must be PE1 because we're only running this on two PEs. If I'm PE1, I want to send a message. So PE0 is going to receive a message, PE1 is going to send a message. So let's look at how this looks here. PE1 is sending a message, it's going to be number to send. That variable happened to, get, is, happened to be set equal to 42. We said we want to send the integer 42. Number to send is set equal to 42. So PE0 is going to send 42, which is one integer, to PE0 with a tag of 10. I picked a tag of 10 because who cares? We don't really care about tags here, uh, but I'll pick 10 because I can. Uh, in general, you just leave that set equal to zero uh, if, you're, if you're not using it, but it's harmless instead of equal to 10 here because we're going to receive it with any tag. So that's what PE0 does. From PE0's perspective, all it does in this code, and this is a good way to think of MPI codes, think of it from the perspective of each of the PEs. PE0's or 1's perspective here, so PE1's perspective, it jumps into this code, calls a nit com rank to find out that it's PE1, says, I don't care about this stuff because I'm not PE0. I'm supposed to send a message because I'm PE1, and then it drops off the end of the world and it's done. So from PE1's perspective, this code is basically just send a message and drop off. That's what it does. And it does that at its own pace and its own time. And meanwhile, somewhere else is PE0. And PE0 in its own space and time is over here. Let's see how it looks at this piece of code. PE0 does the same thing. It starts out. Uh, Com rank finds out it's PE0, and it says, I'm PE0, okay, I had best receive a message. So it sits here to receive a message. And I say sits here because MPI receive is kind of the default mode of MPI message passing, which is blocking. MPI send and receive, you'll see these default versions are called blocking versions. That means that they block, they wait until uh, a message that fits its parameters is there. Otherwise, I mean, they could wait forever if no message ever comes, but they don't just say there's no message and go on their way. Instead, they wait for a message that fits these parameters. What are the parameters here? It'll take any message from any source. So basically, it's going to wait for a message. So PE0 is going to sit here and wait for a message. Now, is that message waiting for it already when we get here? I'll ask you guys. Anybody have a clue? Is, it, is When it gets to MPI receive, is there a message waiting or not? Depends on when the other one is finished or not. That, that's exactly right. It depends. We don't know. We don't know if the message is already here when MPI received is called. Depends on how fast PEL1 is. We don't know how fast PEL1 is. Depends on how fast the network is. Depends on a lot of stuff that we don't know and we don't care about. A well-written MPI program doesn't care. If the message is here already, that's great. It'll receive it and continue on its way. If the message isn't here, it will block. That's why it's called a blocking receive and wait until the message gets there. So in MPI codes, you should picture these messages are in transit, in route. They might be fast, they might be slow. Some of the PEs might be faster, slower than others. Doesn't matter. Same result will come out at the end. So it gets to receive. It might block, it might not. But eventually it gets the message and it prints the result out and then falls off the end and it's done. So that's exactly what happens. I'll step through it with the Fortran code too. Same exact thing. But ask questions if you don't get this because this is, again, the key concept is you step through this from the perspective of each one of the PEs, and that tells you exactly what's going to happen on that piece of serial code. Uh, yeah, it's the, re the next set of slides is because people can't help but wonder what is the mechanism that's going on in the background. But, but right before we get there, let me do what I just did in the C code with the Fortran code, and at least step through the code from the code's perspective, ignoring what happens in the background. From the code's perspective, again, PE0, we step through the code as PE0. So if I'm PE0, well, this is where I actually find out on PE0 when I call com rank. So on PE0, I call com rank, I find out, oh, I'm PE0, so I'd best execute this little bit of code here. I want to receive a message. So if I'm PE0, I'm going to sit here waiting to receive a message. And that's fine because eventually PE1 is going to send me that message. I'm going to receive that number. It's going to be a one integer from, from anybody, anywhere, and I'm going to print it out. Meanwhile, Concurrently, PE1 is out there trying to send a message. So PE1 does the same thing when it's running and it sends the message. And it's that one number to send, which is equal to 42 up here, uh, right here. It sends it and everybody falls off the end and we're done. So that's what happens. Now, again, if you don't understand this code line by line, this is a good time to ask questions. 
But what I do want to do is step through this. I didn't used to do this. I used to think, well, it's not necessary to know the details behind the scenes, but everybody you can't help but wonder exactly what's going on and why. How, why are these things built the way they are? So I'm going to step through exactly what happens when we send a message. Now, it's not critical. We could, we could proceed along without knowing this, so please don't get too intimidated that this detail is here, but it does tell you exactly how and why the MPI system implements things the way it does when it sends messages. Do I see a question, Steve? Yeah. No, okay. So here's what happens when we send a message, and we'll break it down. When we send an array, we'll think about sending an array here, because that's more typical. MPI messages are usually not one integer. They're usually big chunks of arrays. They're a strip of weather along the border of, you know, between states, which means it's got lots and lots of elements. So we're sending an array or some more complicated structure. Uh, and so we want to send a bunch of data from PE0 to PE1 in this case right here. So it's array A, and we want to send it over here to PE1. What actually happens is, is multiple steps. The array, first of all, gets copied into a send buffer which waits until the network's able to send it. That might be very soon. It might be backed up. But whenever it does, eventually it sends it in the background. That gets copied into a receive buffer on the other side. And it sits in this queue right here until you call MPI receive. So when you call MPI receive, there might be a bunch of messages here. There might be none. If there are none, it'll block. If there are none that match, for example, there could be messages waiting, but maybe they're the wrong type, it'll also block. But when it finally sees a message in the queue, when you call MPI receive it, that fits, it'll receive it. Let's look at this step by step. So first of all, we call MPI send. We've got this array sitting here, and it makes this copy. Now, why do we make this copy? Why does it make a copy? Why doesn't it just copy its straight out of memory? The reason it makes a copy uh, is that as, if we make a copy here, then we can proceed right after we send the data to go ahead and use this array. We can mess with this array. So if we've got our weather map and we're figuring out the weather here in Pennsylvania, as soon as I send that weather along the strip on the border, I can go back to doing my computations. I don't have to worry about did that data get sent yet or not. Because if the data didn't get set, I can't touch it. I don't want to mess with the data until I know it's on its way. So making a copy makes life easy on us because it means as soon as send returns, no matter how long it actually takes to get copied, I can go ahead and, and mess with all the data that I've got sitting around memory. I've got this safe copy out here ready to send. Now, this is a little bit expensive. It costs us a little bit. And that's why we'll see there are alternatives in MPI to doing it this way. But this is a good starting point because it's very safe. So we call MPI blocking send. It means it sends this out here, makes a copy of it, and we continue on our way. Now, eventually in the background, across the network, however long it takes, that copy is sent and stuck into the receive queue on the other side, and it sits there. Now, it will sit in that queue as long as it takes till a receive comes along, and then it's received. So this is the exact steps in the process that happens, and that's why the copies are made, is so that things, your code can run on its way without the MPI stuff getting in the way. Uh, now, let's look at what happens. We've got a bunch of stuff stacked up in the receive queue if we have a bunch of messages. So here's our queue, maybe on PE0. We've got a bunch of messages stacked up here, uh, a bunch of data. In this case, it's a bunch of integers it looks like we're sending. And these are the source and this is the tag. So when we call receives with our sources and our tags, we're picking out, we're filtering out of messages that we have sitting around which ones we want to receive. So if we say we want to receive a message from a source one with a tag of two, then it's going to go down this list, look from source one with a tag of two, and grab 4444. If we say source three with a tag of two, it's going to go down this list and get uh, three with a tag of two, uh, oh, right up here, three with a tag of two. Now, if there are multiple messages from the same PE, from PE3 with a tag of two, and there are, there's another one down here with a tag of two, it'll grab the first one, because they are sent in order across the network. On the other hand, if there are multiple messages from multiple PEs, it doesn't actually know what order they came in. It could grab any one of them. So, for example, here, if we receive a message, anyone with a tag of two, it could grab any one out of this queue right here. So it's not going to worry about what order they came in or anything else. And that's fine. So and if it's not fine to you, then you can order them yourself with tags or whatever. So think of the messages as building up in the queue, and your receives is basically picking any messages out of the queue. So what would happen here if we just tried to receive a message with a tag of four, uh, or excuse me, from the source of four with a tag of two, well, there's no message for four yet, so it's going to block. It's going to wait, even though there's a bunch of messages in the queue, it'll wait until a message shows up. So this is how the messages build up. Now, there are, uh, we won't get into it just yet, but we'll find out that there are a class of non-blocking receives that are very useful. And the reason that they exist, there are multiple reasons they exist, efficiency reasons, and sometimes make algorithms easier to write. But the number one reason that blocking sends and receives 
can be uh, uh, tricky or require a little bit more thought, is that if we send very large messages, and an MPI, again, we're working in scientific codes, it's not unusual for messages to be me many megabytes in size. So if we have very large messages, now we can have a problem where they wouldn't fit maybe into this queue. But MPI is able to deal with that. So MPI is perfectly capable of dealing with very, very large messages. Again, scientific problems. If you want to send gigabytes around, that might be a reasonable thing to do. The way MPI will cope with that, though, is that it will slice your message up into chunks like this. And this is where the blocking can happen on the send side. So what can happen here is that if we send a very large message and it sends these chunks out, if the system ends up with, with uh, a chunk sitting here in the receive queue, then there's really no more it can send through until this, this pipeline starts to be empty, right? until you start to receive messages here in PE1. So this data back here is still sitting here. It can't send it all. It means we can't go and mess with this data or we're in jeopardy of, you know, if we continue on our way with our send before all the data has been flushed through the system, there's the possibility we could mess with data still a variable that hasn't been sent yet and we could be sending some, some bad data. So what MPI will do in this case by default is it will block. That's why it's a blocking send. It means the sends try not to block. The, try, the sends try to make a copy and get right back to you and let you continue. But in the event that you're sending so much data that they can't, they will block. Again, as a courtesy to you so that you don't accidentally go and, and modify data that still hasn't been sent. Now the problem with this blocking send is that it wouldn't be uncommon for you to structure a code that looks like this, where they're trying to swap data. We've got our weather between Pennsylvania and Ohio, and we want to swap data back and forth. And so we might both try to send a big chunk of data. And the problem is they're both going to get stuck in the sends, blocking, because neither one of them get down to the receives to start to relieve that pipeline. And we'd end up with what's called a deadlock. They're both trying to send. Nobody can get to the receive. Everything locks up, and your code hangs with a deadlock. So this is a deadlock. This is where blocking sends and receives can run into trouble with large data structures. And this is where non-blocking sends and receives come in. They're very straightforward to convert from blocking to non-blocking. We will do it. We will see plenty of examples of that. Uh, but for beginning, it's nice just to start with blocking because it, it's the most, it's the least error-prone way to do things. Everything's going to Anytime you call send, you can continue on and know that it's sent. And so we're going to stick with blocking as long as we can for our simple examples, but we'll also look to, at non-blocking. And it's not a big deal to move on. So one of the nice things about MPI is it gives us multiple opportunities amongst these many different communication routines to optimize, to go from starting with blocking sends and receives, to go all the way to single-sided message passing, which has almost no, no extra overhead. And tomorrow we'll cover that, but the nice thing about it is that you can do it incrementally. You don't have to regret that you didn't start out using MPI in this uber-optimized fashion, and now you've got to go rewrite your code and your algorithm doesn't work. Instead, we'll find it's a very nice transition. You can start writing a code, develop it with blocking sends and receives because it's a very friendly way to go, harder to make mistakes. And then you can you know, go in and, and, and optimize things as much as you want in an incremental fashion. It's pretty, you know, pretty painless. Uh, so we will stick with blocking sends and receives here for most of our beginning examples because it's the simplest. There are a couple of other, again, the library is extensive, lots of variations, uh, but variations is a theme. It's not, they're drastically different. There are a lot of variations on sends and receives. The ones that are uh, very straightforward to implement is the B send, S send, and R send. Basically, all you need to do is change the name of the routine, and they behave slightly differently. So, for example, uh, the standard mode send that we're using here, it'll block if we run out of space. That's what we just discussed. We could use buffered mode. It'll never block. Instead, it'll return an error condition if it, the message is too big. You, you might want that behavior. We could use S send. It'll only return when there's a matching uh, receive already on the other end. And we could use R send. It'll only work if there's already a receive there, or else it'll have undetermined behavior. It's very tricky. These are kind of obsoleted by the non-blocking stuff that we'll look at later. So these aren't all that interesting. I just point them out because you'll, you'll run across them. Uh, one, the, the only thing that's interesting, I think, about any of this is if you are ever worried about blocking and you worry if your, your normal blocking sends and receives would cause a problem, if you change all your sends to S sends, they'll always hang unless a receive is in place. It's kind of a way of triggering what if all of my data structures were huge. Because how huge is your data structure depends on the buffering and a bunch of implementation details that might vary from one platform to the other when you run into a deadlock problem. So you can trigger that deadlock problem if you want to by changing all your sends to S sends, and it'll make it happen. But again, this is a, uh, these are minor details that are typically obsoleted as soon as you learn how to do non-blocking sends and receives wherever you think that this problem might show up. So we'll do that later instead of dwelling on this. 
So to reiterate, it's actually quite simple. This is our send and receive routine. So we stepped through all the behind the scenes stuff now. So you get a picture of what's going on and why it's set up that way. But here's all it amounts to when you're coding, right? So as an MPI programmer, you, you want to be aware of maybe the things that are happening in the background, but you're, you're not obsessed with it. Here's, a, I want to send and receive messages as simple as send, receive, boom, here I did it. I sent the message back and forth between the two PDs. And here's the Fortran version. So if everybody's good with this, if you can look through this code right now, and there are no mysteries to this, you're in good shape, and we're going to move on. If, there, if this still, if you're not quite sure what's going on here, ask questions, because this is, again, this is foundational stuff. We're going to keep building up from here. So, and we can always come back to anything if there are questions. Yes? Uh, can MPI any source and MPI any tag be used simultaneously in all the MPI implementations? I don't know. I, I say that again. Receive. So can you make an MPI receive with both MPI any source and MPI any tag? At the same, can I use so any source and any tag at the same time? The same time. Abs absolutely, yes, I can. And that's just saying I'll take any message that's coming at me, yes. So you can use MPI any source and any, any tag at the same time. And that might not be uncommon in a part of your code where, you know, for example, if we're just exchanging weather at the border and I know everybody just wants to exchange, then I don't really care uh, to, to be selective at all. So yes, you can use them at the same time. And you can always use status after the fact, by the way, after the fact, figure out where did that come from and what was its tag. Okay, we're going to do a third example here. We're going to keep ratcheting up the uh, complexity here as we head towards doing a real problem here. Our third example is going to, uh, to use the one piece so far that I said is, is fundamental to doing parallel programming, message passing, synchronization. So far we haven't synchronized anything yet. We just sent messages. We'll find out when we start to do real problems and keeping things on the same page because these things are independent. These codes are independent. I can't emphasize that enough. You should think of them as running independently. Well, sometimes you do want to bring them together at one point and synchronize, and we'll do that here. So here, we're going to write a code. It's kind of pointless, but it's going to jump us through all the right hoops to exercise these things. We're going to have P0 send a num another number to the other three P's. It's going to run at four P's. P0 is going to send a number to the other three P's. They're going to each multiply that number by their own P number. Uh, then they're going to print the results out in order. So now we're going to, with our hello world program, remember it didn't print out in order, and then when we, once we thought about it, we thought, okay, there's no reason it should. All eight of these hello world things are just all trying to print. Why would, why would PE0 get to be first? Well, now we're going to insist that PE0 gets to be first. So we're going to figure out if we can impose some order on this thing. Uh, then we're going to send them back to PE0, the results, for PE0 to sum, sum them up and print them out. So these are our steps. We're going to make this stuff happen just to prove that we're in charge here. Now I have some very ghosty text here that's kind of foreshadowing. For those of you that are familiar with either MPI to some extent or other parallel programming things, we're going to find out that what we're really implementing here is we're implementing our own version of broadcasting some data out that MPI will make easier for us to do with its own routine, synchronizing some things with barriers, and lastly doing a reduction here to collect all the data together. So these are things that MPI has single routines to make easier for us. To, we're going we're gonna to do it the, the, the simple-minded way here with the routines that we have in hand. So let's go ahead and do this. So here's the full code. We're going to step through this line by line, what we're trying to do here. So here's the C1. Again, we'll do the Fortran one. So the C code right here uh, and the Fortran code uh, are, are not huge, but we'll step through it line by line. So here's the first step. We, wanted this, we said we wanted PE0 to send a number to the other three PEs. So we've got the, the master code, PE0, in, in red, the slave code in green here for each one of the steps. So PE0 is going to send a number. And that number to send, it happens to be equal to, uh, uh, where is it up here? Number to send. Uh, where is it? Number, C, number to send is equal to 4. It's equal to 4 up here. So number to send is equal to 4. It's going to send this number 4 to each one of the other three PEs. It does it in a little for loop down here. So it sends it to PE1, 2, and 3. That's one integer. With, uh, this is the destination is now an index, it's a variable, so it's going to send one integer, it's going to send it to one, two, and three, with a tag of ten here, because why not? The other three PEs are going to receive one message apiece from PE0 with a tag of ten, because that's what the tag we're using here, and it better be one integer, and they're going to receive these three. So this is step one, this is we're sending and receiving from PE0 to the other three PEs, they're going to each get one message, which is equal to number 42. Everybody good with that? Okay, then the other three PEs are going to take that message and multiply it by their own PE number. 
So PE1 is going to multiply 4 times 1, PE2 is going to end up with uh, 8, and PE3 is going to end up with 12, right? So we've got a result here. That's, so what's the value of result? Again, it doesn't make sense to say what's the value of result. Result has a value on each one of the PEs, right? There's, there are four copies of this program running. So result could be, uh, will be 4, 8, or 12. What's result equal to on PE0? That's a good question, isn't it? Because PE0 never even gets down here to set this. So it's kind of undefined, I guess, that, which is fine because we don't care. So next step, we want to print the results out in order. Well, this is where we want to do something that we didn't, didn't have in the Hello World program. We, didn't, we couldn't force that order in the Hello World program. So what if I wrote a program like this? This is some pseudocode here, right? This is an actually correct code. If I wrote some, some code that looked kind of like this, if I said, if my PE0 print hello from 0, if my PE1 print hello from 1, will this print out in order? This is going to enforce us to print out in order right here. Any guesses? Print on order? No. No. Okay. Well, local crew is pretty savvy here. Recognize the answer is no. This won't. This will not work because let's think of the worst case scenario here. What if, which is always a good way to go with MPI, I always think of these ridiculous extreme cases and it will tell you if your code's honest. So, what if one PE is a million times faster than another? Right? A well written MPI program shouldn't care. It'll run maybe slow, but it'll still get the right answer. So, what if PE3, for example, is a million times slower than PE6? Well, PE6 is certainly going to get down here and figure out I'm not PE0, I'm not PE1, I'm PE6. It's going to get down there and print out PE6 before PE3 ever gets, figures out that it's even PE3, right? So this does not force anything yet. You might think there's some kind of statistical nonsense going on here with which one's got to go, but that, that's no way to think of MPI code. So we haven't enforced anything here, so the answer is no. We, we can't, this does not work to print out an order. How about if we had a command called barrier? And barrier is something that if, and if you have done any other kind of parallel programming, shows up everywhere in parallel programming, there's always a barrier. And barrier's job is to make sure that all of the PEs get to that point before any of them are allowed to continue. That's explicitly what a barrier does. It's a fence that says everybody gets here no matter how fast or slow you are. You all have to get here and wait for the slowest one to get here, and then you can all go on your way. So if we had a command called barrier, then, and we put it here between each one of these lines from the previous example, how about this? Will this print out an order? And the answer is now it will. This will work because it doesn't matter that PE3 is a million times slower than PE6. PE6 still has to wait here at this barrier for PE3 to get there before it can continue. It can never get ahead of PE3 no matter how much faster it is. So this is like our book club again. If we say everybody stop when you get to chapter two, then we can continue, that's like a barrier, right? Doesn't matter how fast or slow the readers are, right? We all have to sync up at that point before we can continue. Nobody can get ahead. So that's what barriers are. And so in our case now, uh, we fixed the problem. Doesn't matter how much faster or slower one is, no matter how extreme, this is always going to work. And of course, we're lazy. We're gonna write this in a loop. So if we stick a barrier to loop, this is going to do exactly what our previous pseudocode just did, right? So from 0 to 7, no matter how fast any of the PEs are, they each have to wait one through the iterations of this loop for the others to catch up. So this loop will print out the hellos in order every time. Now, there's one little, here's a little reality note here for you, is that a lot of MPI systems, uh, most MPI systems, because standard I.O., as somebody asked the, the I think, uh, insightful question earlier, uh, what about standard I.O.? Uh, how does that work in parallel? And I said, well, MPI runs nice. It collects all your I.O. for you and everything. One of the problems with that is that everything gets buffered. Modern computing systems love to buffer stuff for your speed benefit and for performance benefits. And so if you print something out, if you use an actual print statement in the middle of an MPI program, it might not show up immediately from one of the PEs. And it might, uh, that might confuse you or annoy you a little bit. Uh, and so uh, you might dig into it and say, I'm gonna, I can flush things. You can get on this whole this whole track of how you can force things to print in real time as you, as you put them out. And it's a pain in the butt. Here's a quick end run. If you're going to use print statements in your MPI code, particularly to debug, which a lot of you might appreciate over the next day, uh, if you're going to use print statements in your code and you want to make sure that that print statement does not get buffered, it gets spat out when you print it so that things stay in order, using a uh, writing to the standard error usually defeats that, at least it has on every system I've ever come across. The way to do that in Fortran is to write to unit zero. The way to do that in C is to, to have print the standard error. So if you really want to put print statements in your code and really want to make sure that they're working, if you think that they might be buffered or something, this works. 
That said, for most of what you're doing here, if you want in the middle of your code to see what the value of a variable is or something, if you just put a print statement in, it'll probably work fine. But if you do put a print statement in and you're convinced that it's the print statement didn't come out, it got buffered somewhere, this is a nice little end run around that. So a little practical note for those of you that are going to program. On the other hand, by the end of tomorrow, I'll show you a parallel debugger. That's always the best way to deal with bugs in code, is, is not just in parallel. Using debuggers is uh, one of the most underappreciated things, I think, in, uh, in computing. And I'll show you a parallel debugger, which means you'd never have to use print statements to debug your code. But at any rate, this little digression, I think, will save some of you frustration if you find yourself trying to do print statements in the middle of NPI codes and thinking, I know I printed that out. Where did it go? Meanwhile, the answer is that whoever built your cluster, you know, the, the way it's configured, it's got buffering going on and whatnot. This defeats that. So back to our real problem, though. Uh, and our real problem was that we, we now had these results here on each one of the PEs. PE1 has a result <coughs> 4, PE2 has a result 8, PE3 has a result 12. We would like them to print out in order their results. So now, armed with this barrier command, we can stick it in a loop here so that each PE gets its chance to print, and this barrier makes sure none of them can race ahead of the other. This will print out in order here. So here's our results printed out in order. And now we can move on to our last steps here, which are to have each one of the PEs send their results back to PE0 so that PE0 can print out the sum. So if I'm not PE0 here, I want to send a result back to PE0 with a tag of 10 again we'll use because why not. If I'm PE0, I've got a little for loop here and I want to read three messages. And in this case here, I'm going to make sure that they come in in the order I want. So I'm going to read message 1, message 2, and message 3 with a tag of 10, add them together, and print out the total. So that is that. Let's look at this from the... Uh, uh, Oh, okay, let me go back up to the top. Let's look at this from the Fortran code perspective. It's the exact same logic. So again, see people keep thinking through this, Fortran people. Uh, we'll step through it. It's the exact same logic though, so it shouldn't, shouldn't, be, uh, shouldn't be seeing anything different here. If I'm PE0, I want to send three messages, or excuse me, yes, PE0, I want to send three messages equal to the number four to the other three PEs. They're a message uh, with a tag of 10. So I do that. The other three PEs receive that message. Then they figure out their own version, their own value for result. Then we have each of them print that out with this barrier to make sure that the results get printed out in order. No matter how fast or slow any of the PEs are, they're going to come out 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or in this case, 0, 1, 2, 3. Uh, or in this case, actually, 1, 2, 3. Yes, a question. Um, so I, I don't understand why the NTI barrier Okay. That's a fair question. You're probably not the only one asking again. So how what exactly is going on here? Let's think about this. Why is the barrier inside the do loop here? Well, if we put the barrier, if we put the barrier, say we move the barrier outside of the do loop at the beginning, then its function would be all the PEs would race to the beginning of the do loop and have to wait, right? And then they would all enter the do loop. And once again, what if PE3 is a million times faster than PE2? Well, then PE3 is going to race through this loop, say I'm not PE1, I'm not PE2, oh, I'm PE3, my turn to print out. Well, PE2 is back going through the loop very slowly, going, am I PE1? No. Am I PE2? Okay, I can print out. Well, PE3 already printed out before me. So the barrier outside of the loop would get them to all start the loop at the same time, but some of them could potentially race ahead. Now let's think of exactly what's going on here. It never hurts to be explicit in exactly thinking through exactly what's going on from any PE's perspective. Let's say I'm PE2. So if I'm PE2 here, I come down through the code, do all my thing to get to this point. I'm PE2. I jump into this do loop here. Okay, I call barrier. Okay, I'm PE2. Well, I don't care how fast or slow I am. I have to wait for PEs 1 and, and 3 to catch up with me. So PEs 1 and 3, actually 0 as well. So the other three PEs have to catch up with me, or I catch up with them. I don't know whether I'm fast or slow, but I know we're all at the same point in this loop. Now we've all raced through this first iteration of the loop. So that means that PE1 gets to print out its result. 
We all race through it. Now, I don't care, again, if I'm slow or fast, we all have to stop here and wait again for PEs one or three to race ahead, catch up, whatever they have to do. We each go through this loop and have to wait. So this causes the race to be stopped three times in that loop to make sure everybody gets their fair chance. So we're basically forcing this behavior right here. If we unroll it, we're doing this. We're forcing this to happen right here. Whereas if we put the barrier at the beginning of the loop, it would be like having one barrier at the top and getting rid of all these. And it still turns into a foot race then without barriers guaranteeing things. So if the barrier is in the loop, it's this. If the barrier is not in the loop, it's like having one barrier here, and then there, it's a foot race again. So the barrier makes sure that they have to pause every iteration of this loop. And no matter how much faster, again, a million times is fine. Whether something's a million times faster or not, it's still going to, whoops, here we go. It's still going to have to wait the faster one or the slower one for the barrier every iteration of the loop. So does that, is that, does that make sense to you? Again, you're, uh, many of you are probably asking the same question here because, it's, again, it's a slightly different way of thinking than, than writing serial code and thinking about all these players in the game at the same time. Can I ask a question? Yes, go ahead. Um, um, process zero never even gets to that point. Why is it not waiting infinitely for process zero to get there? That's an excellent question because you're right and you're wrong on a, in a very crucial way. Process zero does get there, and if process zero didn't, you're right. We would have a serious problem. This is maybe the most common MPI bug, and um, many of you, if not most of you, will have it happen today, which is where you have a barrier or something, and one of the PEs that's supposed to participate doesn't get there. In this case, PE zero, you're right, had best participate. Where you're wrong is that PE zero does get there, though, because let's look at this from PE zero's perspective. Always a good thing to do. If I'm PE0, I'm working my way through this code. This code concerns me here if I'm PE0. I do this. I don't care about this green code. Okay, I don't care about this either. PE0 does participate. If I'm PE0, why would I not participate in this loop? I do. Now, I'm silent because I'm never going to be equal. The index goes from 1 to 3. So I don't get to do anything in this loop because it's going to start out at 1 and skip me. So I never get to print, but I do, get, I do participate. So PE0 is participating in this barrier here, as it had best, because COM world, the barrier also gets a cho choice of subsets of PEs and everything else. We'll get into this later. But with COM world, it means all the PEs had best participate. And so PE0 does participate in this loop. It's just silent about it because it doesn't get to print anything out because the index is never equal to zero. So this if statement never lets PE0 do anything, but it better race through the loop because if it didn't, you're right, it would hang. It would, everybody would be sitting here waiting for PE0. So if I, if I put, if, not, if, I'm PE, if I'm not PE0, do this loop on the outside, which I might be tempted to do because PE0 doesn't need to print anything out. So I could put an if statement on the outside. If I'm not PE0, do this loop, then I would have a problem because the barrier would never have PE0 meet up with it and they couldn't continue. So PE0 does participate in this loop, but it just never gets to print anything out because its index is never equal to zero. So that's it. That's Excellent question. Okay, so keep the questions coming because this is the stuff that if you get it, everything else from here on out is kind of downhill and variations on this. As I said, this is really the last piece of the puzzle, the synchronization stuff. Now we're sending and receiving messages and doing synchronization. Everything else is just a way to make this easier. But if you, you make sure you understand all of this. So the last step of our particular problem here is that if we're PE0, we want to uh, receive three messages. And if we're not PE0, we want to send one message. So the other three PEs send an integer to PE0. That's going to be the integers 4, 8, and 12. PE0 is going to get those and print its result out. And the, the final output is going to look like this. These are the three things printed in order every single time. And here's the total. So. Once again, we can come back to this code. We can return to this code as often as we have to to make sure everybody's good with this. If you're good with this, you're pretty much the concept, the important concepts are clicking, sending and receiving, synchronization. Uh, if you're not, it's, it's, you're going to get confused as we move on. So we can come back and, and dig through this as much as we have to. One of the ways I've stepped through this code, maybe the most important way I've stepped through this code, as I said, I pick, I pick a PE and pretend I'm that PE, and I step through the code like that PE. 
And that, that keeps me honest. It keeps me from thinking about this line of code being executed eight times or something like that. Now, I think I got a serial code. I'm stepping through it with a certain PD number. Yes? Uh, quick question. I ran that piece of code, and sometimes the total printed out before the individual numbers and the order wasn't correct. Would that just be because we didn't print a standard error? Yeah, that's, 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 that's exactly right. Just the print is doing the wrong timing. That, that's exactly I'm surprised you saw it. I don't see that so much because we have the buffering and bridges set pretty Right. Tightly, but if you do, like one in ten yes. Right. So if you change that to, to the standard error, it will never happen. Okay. Yes, that's strictly buffering. Okay. So if if we're good with this, then we'll move on and do something that's actually not uh, a stupid problem. It's actually uh, does something quite useful. A uh, good example of how how easy parallelization can be to get really nice scalable speed ups. Because uh, we've got these four basic things. We can start the processes, we can send and receive messages, and we can synchronize. So we can, we can theoretically do just about anything right now. <coughs> we'll find out we're just going to get better at doing these things in a more convenient way. So we're going to look at a, uh, a routine that does, uh, does actually does integration over a curve in parallel in a very scalable fashion. And it will allow us to introduce uh, reduction broadcasts uh, and broadcasts, which are, are really useful uh, things that we wouldn't uh, want to have to write primitively ourselves. So here's our example. We're going to find the value for pi by integrating under half a circle, because we know the area of a circle is pi r squared. So we're going to integrate under half a circle to find out this area. And we're going to do with old school uh, uh, Simpson's rule calculus, where you, you basically break your, your curve up into a bunch of rectangles and sum up those rectangles, right? So this is a nice, simple numerical way to break a curve up and find out its value. But it's easy to parallelize, because say we're running this on five PEs. Each PE now only has to calculate a couple of bands instead. So PE3 only has to calculate two bands instead of all 10 of them. So this is a nice parallelizable way to find an integral. And although this is a very simple problem, finding the values of integrals is an important thing to be able to do numerically. And this is a way that works very, very scalably, uh, not just on five PEs, but on 5,000 or 5 million for that matter. So we're going to find the value of pi here. Uh, by, by doing it this way. This will allow us to introduce a couple of these convenience routines, some very important ones that will buy us a little bit more than convenience as well. But some of these convenience routines I mentioned, we're going to figure out how to do, use a broadcast and a reduce here. They're uh, ubiquitous in, in parallel programming because they're so useful. Uh, and they're also very convenient in MPI. Uh, it, it, what we want to do here before we start our code is we want to let the other PEs know some information about uh, how many intervals the user wants. So in our coder, the user gets to pick how many of these slices uh, the thing should be broken up into. The user might want a very accurate value of pi, might want a million slices here, for example. That wouldn't be unreasonable. Uh, or they might want a very rough and fast value of pi and might want 100 slices. So the user gets the input, will input to us the number of slices. Uh, also, the number of PEs that the code is running on, we're going to start writing like real MPI codes that can vary. So far, our examples ran on two PEs and then four PEs, and we kind of locked into that. As I mentioned, that's not a very nice MPI code. You'd like an MPI code that's more flexible. As a matter of fact, a good exercise for you might be to go back and look at our previous two examples and say, what would happen if I ran our last example on eight PEs instead of the four that we talked about? Interesting exercise. I think, think you should be able to figure it out. But we'd like to write codes where we anticipate that they'll run on varying numbers of PEs. So we're going to write this code so that it can run on however many user types when they type MPI run. It'll work fine on, on 10 PEs or 100 PEs, and it'll work fine on a million uh, subdivisions of the circle or 10,000. So we're going to be a little more flexible in our code. So we have some variables that we'd like to communicate to all the PEs, how many PEs they're running on and what the user typed in. For example, we don't want the user to have to type into each PE how many slices it has. We want the user to type it in once and to send it to all the PEs. This is what we did in our previous example when we said we had the number on PE0, the number 4, and we wanted it to let the other three PEs know about that number. So we wrote a little for loop that broadcast one message to each of those PEs. Well, that's a common enough case that you have a variable you want all the other PEs to know about. That It's nice that MPI provides us a routine to save us from writing lots of for loops called broadcast. So MPI bcast allows us to send one variable to all the other PEs simultaneously. Not only is it a nice time saver and makes our code look cleaner, it's also much more efficient, right? Me giving this lecture broadcasting to everybody is a lot more efficient than me visiting each one of you personally and, and telling it to you. It's the same with broadcasting in MPI. A broadcasting over the network is a lot faster than a bunch of copied point-to-point -point messages. So Bcast is here for us. We're going to use it in this code. <coughs> the inverse of Bcast, in a sense, is a reduction operation, where a bunch of the PEs have some value, and we'd like them to be brought back uh, and added together. 
Now we did this in the previous example also. In our previous example, we said each one of the three PEs had their, their own result, 4, 8, or 12. And we wanted to sum those together. So we wrote a for loop and it summed them together. Now, that also is a very common thing to do, to have the PEs have some partial computation. We'd like to add them together. So a re MPI reduce is a nice, elegant way to do that. And once again, it not only saves us some typing and makes our code look cleaner, it also is very efficient. Reduce operations can be done much better than a bunch of point-to-point -point operations. The best example I can give you is with this class today, for example, let's say everybody out there had a number and I wanted to add them together. Uh, you could each walk up to the microphone and tell me the number and I could sit here and 200 times write down the number and it would take us 200 cycles to, to get that, that sum. Or I could say each of you turn to your neighbor and tell you to add your sums together. Now how many sums? Now in one cycle we've got 100 sums instead of 200. Okay, everybody turn to your neighbor. Now we've got 50 sums. So now we could take and reduce in 8 steps instead of 200 steps, we could end up with our total. So reduction operations give the, the MPI underlying system an opportunity to be very efficient too. And, they, and believe me, underneath MPI, the, the people that write this make sure that, that reduce operations and whatnot do the proper things to either butterfly data down or do more sophisticated things. So reduce is not just a time saver for us, it's a time saver at runtime. So we've now got these two things that we could have, we did write by hand in the previous example. Now we've got these routines. So let's look at our finding pi code. Here's our whole code. Oh, there's one more little routine I'll bring in here that's very common. It's, it's too simple to, to bear its own slide, which is com uh, size. Com size tells us how many PEs we're running on. It's that simple. Number of processors. So that's, that's common enough. If you've got a code and you want it to be flexible so that it can run on different numbers of PEs, then you need to figure out how many PEs you're on. So com size will tell us that. So if we, if we type MPI run dash N8, numproc will come back with 8. If we say dash N8000, it'll come back with 8000. So very simple routine, but useful. So here's our whole finding pi code. Here's the C version of it here. Let's look at, at the basics of what's going on here. We've got our generic headers and init com rank, com size. Uh, if we're PE0, we want a, the user to tell us how many intervals to break the, the integration up into. And so here's the input. But again, it's nice that only PE0 deals with the input, and then it can let the other PEs know about that. How? Well, not with the for loop like we did in a previous example. Now we're going to use this bcast. So bcast is very nice. The thing to keep in mind with bcast is that you've got this one variable n, the intervals the user's typing in, which one integer, the PE0 that broadcasts it. So this is called the root parameter right here. It's whoever gets to broadcast it. It's usually PE0. PE0 is a special PE very often. So PE0 is going to broadcast this, and so all of them get a copy of it back in their variable n, but they all have to call broadcast. This is where people get lost sometimes, or get a slightly, slight error, I guess, when you're starting with this, which is bcast is a collective, it's what's called a collective operation. It means all of them have to collectively call it, just like barrier. As we said with barrier, they all have to participate or you get a problem. It's exactly the same with bcast. They all have to call bcast, even though only one of them is broadcasting. It's where the other would do the receive. So if they wanted to be a little bit uh, less compact with their notation, they might have called this broadcast and receive, because that's what it is, but it's not, it's bcast. So only the root broadcast, the rest of them receive, but they all have to call it. So that's what broadcast is, they're all calling it. Then we get into the actual math of the code here, and so here's where it just slices and dices that integral off based on how many PEs you have and how many uh, intervals the user asked for. So this is just math in here, there's nothing outside of just the logic of doing the, the Simpsons rule. And then we've got each one of the PEs has their partial sum, their my pi, their partial sum of pi. And so each one of them needs to get their slice of the pi back to uh, PE0. So how do we do that? Again, in our previous example, we had a little for loop, but now we've got this reduce command, which is wonderful. And again, it's a collective. All the PEs participate in the collective at the same time. So that means they all call it, but only the root PE, and that's what this parameter is zero, only PE0 gets the answer into my pi, oh, excuse me, into pi. The second one's where it gets collected. The first one is the partial sum. So they all add their my pi's and only PE0 gets the total because it's the only one that needs to print it out. There's a reduce, there's all reduce, which actually gets the result back to all the P's. We could call that if we wanted to. If we wanted all the PE's to get the result, they could do that too. Uh, but we don't. We only care for PE0 and that's usually the case is that if we do a reduce that only one PE needs that reduced operation. Uh, if it was the case that they all needed it, we could call all reduce. Or we could call reduce in a broadcast after it if we wanted to be long-winded about it. But all reduce would be the right call there. 
In our case, we're just going to use the straight up reduce. It means that PE0 is the only one that has the answer when we're done, but it's the only one that needs the answer to print it out. And if we're PE0, we print the answer out, and then we're done. So is everybody kind of good with what's going on here, at least these routines that are going on in here? Because this is an example here of something that is very scalable. It does something real here. It's very scalable. It can run on thousands of PEs and get a nice speed up of 1,000 times. So if we run on this 1,000 PEs, I would expect it to be roughly 1,000 times faster you know, on bridges. And you can go ahead and do those experiments if you want later on. I mean, it's, uh, this is a very scalable code. It will run much faster on lots more PEs. This is what MPI is about. Okay, I will. Uh, question. Uh, another question. Yeah, I just uh, can you send the broadcast again because I probably don't know if you want to send it. The MPI broadcast can you just send what it does? Sure. MPI broadcast and what it does. Uh, it deserves a reiteration here. So MPI broadcast is when we've got one variable that we'd like all the other PEs to know about. Well, who has the special variable? Who has the value? Is is the root? So that's the zero here. And that's very often it's going to be zero. So PE zero has a special value. In this case, it's how many intervals the user typed in. So the user, and we only want the user to have to type, right? If we ran this on 1,000 PEs, it would be a disaster if the user had to type in 1,000 times how many intervals, right? So whenever you have I.O. in the code, you're going to see this master-slave paradigm pops up magically. So when we've got a lot of I.O., PE0 is going to often pop up to do the input from the user. So PE0 asks for the input from the user. The other PEs need to find out about that. So everybody calls broadcast. Broadcast is collective. <coughs> they all call it. Although only the root is broadcasting the value, the rest of them are really receiving the value during the broadcast. The value that gets sent out by the root is in N, and the rest of them all receive it back into N. So if I'm PE, say, 3 when running this code, before I call broadcast, the value of N is completely undefined. After it gets called, the value of N is going to be, say, the user typed in uh, 10,000, <coughs> then the value of N is going to be 10,000. So broadcast is doing the same thing that we did in our previous example with our little loop in. So I keep saying previous example just to be clear what I meant. Here is, right there, here is broadcast implemented by hand. If we didn't have broadcast, this is what we'd have to do. We'd have to have PE0 call a bunch of sends to each one of the other PEs. So here's, here's a broadcast done the low level way with sends and receives. Well, as I said, life's too short to keep repeating this chunk of code over and over and over. Also, this isn't as efficient as having a nice dedicated broadcast routine, which is all of that stuff is done here in this one line. So it's very useful. You'll find ourselves using it constantly today and in any MPI program. Same with reduce. Okay, before we jump into our exercises, which we're about to do, uh, I want to remind you again that a good way to work through the code is how I've been doing it. Think of it as the individual PE. Say, okay, I'm PE2 here. How does this code look to me? It's a serial code. It's not a magical parallel language. It's serial programming language. It's serial C code or Fortran code. It's a serial program that just I happen to be PE2 running it. And alongside of me, my brothers and sisters are running as PEs 1 and 3 and 4, but you know, they're all doing their own thing as much as they can. The only time we come together is when we've got a barrier forcing us to. When we do the exercises here, you'll find that uh, MPI manual is just essential to have next to you in the browser to keep track of these, these, all these uh, parameters that are in the uh, routines. And so uh, there are a number of them out there. I will say a good starting point is the MPI forum, for example. Uh, the band page we've been using is from mpitch.org here. So you can go ahead and grab either one of these or find some more from there, whichever ones suit your preferences and level of detail and everything else. But this is a good starting point. I think you'll, be, you'll be find them useful for our exercises. Uh, I'll, I'll point out quickly, there are a couple of good books for MPI, and there are a number of terrible books. Uh, the, the terrible books are generally written with a very computer science-y perspective, which most of you are not. You're scientists trying to get work done with this as a tool. Uh, these books instead are written by the actual, ironically, by the computer scientists that actually wrote MPI, uh, part of them. I mean, it's a big collective effort, but these guys are very important members of the committee. Uh, and they've done a great job of, of writing lots of practical examples. So it's good books if you, if you want to have some paper versions to step your way through. Okay, let's quickly talk about, so we've seen MPI and how it works. I'll, I'll quickly, and I'll point out tomorrow in the outro talk, we'll get into more detail, compare and contrasting. But some of the reasons why MPI here is going to, you know, it is 
going to take some effort for us to do our exercises is that we, we're going to have to rewrite portions of our code. We can't just, so if somebody hands you a 10,000 line program uh, and it's got a lot of dusty corners that you don't know, with MPI we're going to have to dig into it. Maybe that point's better understood after we do our Laplace exercise. Actually, most of these points are better understood after we do our Laplace exercise, so I'll defer some of it this, this until then, because then you will have done some debugging, and so you will have, done, you will have seen a little bit of the, the painful side of MPI after we do some exercises. So let's do the exercises. So the two exercises we're going to start with is exercise one. We're going to write a code that runs on eight PEs and does a uh, circular shift. That's just a way of saying that each PE is going to send the data to, the, to its neighbor, either up or down, your call. So if you want to send it up, it means that PE6 sends to PE7. But PE7 is the, top, is the uppermost PE, so to make it a circular shift, PE7 sends it back to PE0. So 0 to 1, 1 to 2, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what makes it a circular shift. So write a circular shift. This should be pretty straightforward logic-wise for you and, and, and doable with what you've got. Now the second one here is a good bit trickier. The second one uh, here is for you to write uh, a routine that reproduces what this comm size routine that we just learned is. Comm size, as you recall, tells us how many P's we're running on. So in other words, if we said uh, MPI run dash N4 exercise and said comm size, comm size would tell you you're running on four P's. If you say dash N16, comm size would tell you you're running on 16 P's. Well, can you write comm size just using send and receive and barrier, basically. With send and receive and barrier, can you figure out how many PEs you're running on internally and then say, hey, I figured out how many PEs I'm on. Now this question, this, this problem is a good bit more difficult uh, than the first one. So don't bang your head too hard on this wall, uh, but give it a good thought at the very least. Uh, this again is uh, an index, one I just referred to, a nice one to have up while you do this. Uh, these are the two exercises, and so for exercise two, like I said, if you say interact-n8, can it figure out that it's running on eight PEs? Uh, or excuse me, interact-n8 is to ask for eight PEs to run on. And then once you've got those eight PEs, you can run on four PEs or two PEs or six PEs, and can you ever figure that out? Uh, 